Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. It's great to be with you. Yes, Danny Shapiro is here today in the casa. Danny, I first read Devotion. What year was that that it came out? 2010. Cried the whole way through it because now we have the full circle and we'll get to inheritance, of course. But reading how you were raised as a Jew in a fairly religious home and all of the words that you used to describe the sort of subterranean conflict that resided in your heart, which we now know the obviously the full circle of that, which we'll talk about, always resonated with me, like deeply, deeply. I had it all dog-eared. I finally gave it away in my last move, but I was doing so reluctantly. It meant a lot to me to have uh, someone uh, show me what it felt like eloquently to not resist the religion, but to question things and to question my identity and to question what was true for everyone else around me. Um, it gave me a new belief in Judaism. That's wonderful and amazing to hear. It is. It is. And then moving on to, uh, I think I skipped a couple of titles. I moved on to Hourglass was the next title that I read. I skipped things, didn't I? You would have then skipped Still Writing. Right. Yeah. Which I need to read, I have a feeling. My, my little my little memoir of the creative life. Yes. Yeah. That's coming next for me. Um, Hourglass, I actually pulled uh, a bunch of quotes from here because I love it so much. You sent me the uncorrected proof. I think I found a couple of typos, which was very satisfying, which I told You're you about. You're good at that. I'm weirdly good like that. Send me your books and I'll find the typos before they go to print. Um, Hourglass is about your marriage. And I think the most important part about this for me was that it, it reminded me that nothing is ever perfect. And in every imperfection of a relationship backwards and forwards is the total perfection. And it gave me a lot of hope for, uh, my future in a relationship. And I wasn't, uh, I think I was, I think I was with James at the time, early days. So thank you for that. Also, uh, also meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was a book I, I was, I always start a book with questions. Yeah. And the question for me, sort of the central question with Hourglass was, what is it to walk alongside another human being over time? Mm. You know, because my husband and I at that point had been together 18 years. Now we've been together 22 years. Wow. I remember sitting on an airplane reading this galley on corrected proof and just weeping thinking oh my god there's hope there's hope for us all and it was you know it took a lot of twists and turns this book and the notable pages i'm just flipping through it right now here um you quoted virginia wolf the way she was thinking about time the past only comes back when the present runs so smoothly that it is like the sliding surface of a deep river and then one sees through the surface to the depths. But to feel the present sliding over the depths of the past, peace is necessary. And I thought, oh my, this is when I kind of realized I better keep meditating because if I don't, I'll never be able to see clearly the memories that seem to want to haunt me but can't unless I say so. Exactly, exactly. It's so interesting to hear you quoting me, quoting Virginia Woolf, when I haven't thought of that passage in a few years. And like, you know, we hear those things again when we need to, right? I mean, I just, um, because I've been on book tour mm. for inheritance, my, you know, my life has been going a million miles a minute. And 
in the last couple of weeks, it's the first time in years that there's been a stretch of days where I have not meditated. Mm. And I've been fine because it's like I have money in the bank. Yes. But I definitely, like when I returned home and I returned to my routine, which I usually am able to take with me, but it was really hard hotel after hotel and my husband was with me for part of it and I wasn't alone. You know, there were just lots of reasons why it just fell by the wayside. Mm. Um, or really I was on the West Coast and because they're three hours uh, earlier than we are in New York, I would check my email in the morning and so much had already happened that my day began with catch up instead of my day beginning with um, a kind of in a contemplative 20 minute kind of place. Yeah. So, so interesting to hear that wolf pa passage yes. because it's, and your response to it, which is got to keep meditating. Yeah, that's the only thing I thought of. Peace is necessary. Yeah. And the only thing that brings me that. I actually made Jonah meditate with me this morning. How'd yeah. that go? It was fine. Yeah. I bribed him. <laughs> I, I might have bribed Whatever him. Whatever it takes. <laughs> Whatever it takes. Um, so, Hourglass. I have a couple more readings that I just wanted to point out that um, really struck my heart that I wrote them down. Oh, this. <laughs> the... On page 21, you write, the inanity feels like a solid thing. It was the moment that Michael met your ex-husband. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The inanity between you felt like a solid thing. And the, the, for, the former selves between the ages with, uh, of, with the first one and, the, and, and Michael unfolding in front of you like a chain of paper dolls. Yeah. My gosh. Thank you. I um I did feel like that was a real thing, that, that feeling of our I mean that was another thing with hourglass. I mean there was the inquiry about marriage, but really the deeper inquiry was about time mm -hmm. and who we are over time and are all of ourselves still alive within us and were we alive within them and you know that, that girl that I often think of, you know, did, could she reach out to me? Could I reach back to her? And all of the me's in between. The, the quote, change even one moment and the whole thing unravels. The narrative thread doesn't stretch in a line from end to end, but rather spools and unspools, loops and return, loops around and returns again and again to the same spot. Gosh. And when you think about who you are now and who you were then and were you, were, you know, I, I, I made a note um, at the very beginning where you wrote, um, it was something about where you saw yourself early on. Hold on. Oh, yeah. The 19-year-old girl pirouettes over to the 52-year-old woman, her cheeks flushed, arms chubby from the 10 pounds she gained freshman year. She has all the self-knowledge of a Labrador retriever. She just wants to grow up, that's all. And she figures marriage will make that happen as if adulthood is an AP course, an item on a to-do list. The 52-year-old has put in her time, but she doesn't have much patience for the girl. She wishes she'd get on with it. <laughs> yeah, wow. I mean, that, I, I think that the work both creatively and, you know, personally, if they can even be separated, which mm -hmm. probably they can't for me, um, of the last 10 years or so of my life has been about, um, developing or finding a sense of compassion for that girl. Yes. Because I didn't have it early when I was closer in age to her. I mean, I could, I, you know, there's a little bit of an edge in what you just read, and the 52 year old does want her to get on with it, yeah. but the 52 year old also has compassion for her and sees her in all of her sort of young, you know, fallibility and, and, uh, you know, uh, just her ideas, her, yeah. her ideas. I think also, I mean, I have a son who's 19 and I think mm. that it's probably no accident that I went back to very specifically when I was writing Hourglass, I reread and even incorporated into the book some of my journals from yeah. when I was that age. And those were journals that I was never going to ever have anyone ever, ever read. Sometimes I'd be on a, on a flight during turbulence and I, I honestly, the journals would come 
roaring into my mind, like, I meant to burn them. <laughs> I don't want anyone to read them. And then suddenly there I was actually publishing little snippets from them. Yeah. Like owning, owning that girl and that time because I can now. Yeah. If you're listening to this, I always love to give assignments. So if you're listening to this and you did keep journals, your assignment for this episode is to go back to one of the journals, read and locate within your heart a great deal of compassion and write a poem detailing the compassion that you feel for that person who wrote in that journal those years ago. That's a sweet, sweet assignment. To that point, though, oh, child, this is page 68. Somewhere inside you, your future has already unfurled like one of those coiled up party streamers. Once shiny, shaken loose, floating gracefully for a brief moment, now trampled underfoot after the party is over. The future you're capable of imagining is already a thing of the past. Who do you think you would grow up to become? You could never have dreamt yourself up. Sit down. Let me tell you everything that's happening. You can stop running now. You are alive in the woman who watches as you vanish. I think that if I'm allowed to have a favorite passage from a book, that that is my favorite passage from Hourglass. It's just everything. It perfectly encapsulates the, the beautiful act and the desire to have compassion for that person that you once were. Mm. So inheritance. I got this galley proof and I was traveling at the time and I read it in like a day in a bathtub that got very cold. I'll never forget it. And um, you'll forgive that we are very close to a construction site today that sometimes will be making noise for you. My apologies. Inheritance, the subtitle, A Memoir of Genealogy, Paternity, and Love. So why don't you tell us a little bit of the beginning? Because I was enthralled, enraptured in the process of you figuring all of this out. And I would love to hear it from your perspective so the listener can learn from you what happened. Well, I think I would set it up first by just saying that um, all of my life as a writer, I've been writing about family secrets in my fiction, never knowing why. All of my novels center around the corrosive power of family secrets and why families keep secrets. And um, and then my memoirs, I mean, I never thought I was going to write any memoirs. And I turned to memoir and then each time that I was waiting for the next novel to appear, a memoir appeared instead. And no one was more surprised than me. It wasn't an intellectual decision. It was um, it wasn't a decision at all. It wasn't, oh, memoirs sell well. It was nothing like that. Mm -hmm. It was, oh, apparently this is what I'm meant to do next. And so, and in all of my memoirs, and even in some of my fiction, the feeling that I always had was I was writing for my dad. I was writing in some way or another in an attempt to understand him. He died when I was young. He died when I was 23. And I was always kind of trying to piece him together and understand him better make sense of the mystery of him. And so uh, two and a half, three years ago, exact, actually June 30th of 2016, um, results were returned from um, a DNA test that my husband and I both took entirely as a lark. Mm. Um, in fact, my husband was the one who wanted to do it and he asked me if I wanted to do it too. I so easily could have said no, so easily. I don't know why I didn't had no curiosity. I knew everything that there was to know about my family, my family tree, uh, my ancestry. Um, and when the results came back, in pretty short order, what unfolded, the first thing that unfolded was that there was a 50% difference in my ethnicity than what I thought it would be. I would have expected that I would have been close to 100% Eastern European Ashkenazi. And instead, I was about half that. And mm -hmm. the, the other half was French, English, Irish, German, Swedish. And I just thought, well, they've made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> there was no other explanation than they made a mistake. And I um, didn't really, I mean, I was puzzled, but that was kind of the extent of it. And then maybe a week or two later, my husband was tracking all this because he mm. was more than puzzled. He, he had a, more of us. he's a former journalist, so he had he, yeah. he, he was he was already kind of like his nose was to the ground 
And he uh, saw that a first cousin had appeared on my ancestry page who was a total stranger to me. I knew all my first cousins, and here was this male first cousin, identified only by initials, who I had never heard of. And that got my attention, even though I still thought it was a mistake. Um, and I reached out to my much older half-sister, mm. uh, daughter of my father's from an early marriage. And I had recalled that she had told me that she had done DNA testing years before for health reasons, you know, just wanting to know if she had any hereditary conditions. Right. And she indeed had, and she sent me her results. And there's a way, very simple way, to compare two results side by side. And we, you know, I compared the results, or rather my husband did. And as I write in the book, it took 0 0.04538 seconds, a fraction of a second, to reveal that we were not related, that <laughs> she was not my sister, she was not my half-sister, and that meant only two possible things. One would be that our father wasn't her father, right. and the other would be that he wasn't mine. And I knew that it didn't mean he wasn't hers. Um, she looked like him, sounded like him, like him, was much older. I mean, you know, he had been a young man. I knew it meant that he wasn't my father and mm. my biological father. And from there unspooled very quickly a memory of a conversation I had had with my mother 30 years before where she had let slip that I had been conceived um, in an institute in Philadelphia. And she made it very clear that she and my dad had um, had trouble conceiving me and had undergone artificial insemination as a couple together with my father's sperm. And it was something that I sort of tucked away the conversation. I never really thought about it again. It was an odd thing to find out that I'd been conceived that way, but I didn't question in any way that my dad, in fact, I w at the time discovered that they sometimes in the history of reproductive medicine in this country, they would mix donor sperm with the intended, actual father. with the actual father. And I had been told that, and I went back to my mother and I said, you know, I heard that sometimes this happened. And she absolutely categorically denied she it. She denied it. She shut me down. She, what she said exactly was, you knew your father. My father was an Orthodox Jew. You know, you knew your father. Can you imagine such a thing? It would have meant he never, he wouldn't have known that his child was Jewish, which by the way, for your listeners, is in fact not true because in Judaism it comes through the matriarchal line, and right. I knew that. Right. Also, right. as my husband later pointed out to me all these years later when we're looking at these results, yeah. she answered my question with a question. She didn't answer my question. And lastly, she said, wouldn't know his child was Jewish, not wouldn't know his child was his, which is such a an odd thing to say, but yes. it was actually the perfect thing to say. Right. It worked. I thought, well, absolutely, I knew my father. He never would have done such a thing, and it wouldn't have been okay with him to not know. I just, you know, I think one of the things we do, and I've learned a lot about human nature in the last few years, and one of the things we do when we so desperately want to believe something is, you know, our psyche will work overtime to allow ourselves to hold on to what it is that we need to believe. And, and I think deep down somewhere in the recesses of my psyche, I knew. Um, it's all over my work in yeah. a way, thematically and even more than thematically. But there's a, there's a phrase uh, that I write about in Inheritance, psychoanalytic phrase, and it is the unthought known. Right. And I love it so much. Like what we know, absolutely know, but cannot allow ourselves to think because it's just too dangerous. And I think my whole life was formed around that. The soul knowing. The soul knowing. Yeah. And the soul knowing means that there's a kind of, um, I mean, as a child, I always felt other. Yeah. I always felt different. I always felt that I didn't belong. And many kids feel that, but I felt a kind of longing that I did not understand. I didn't understand why I felt it. Yeah. I didn't understand why I didn't feel like I belonged because... I, I, by all accounts, I should have absolutely felt that I did, and I didn't. Yeah. So that not knowing the truth actually had a lot to do with what formed me. And also had a lot to do with your um, need to express this not, this known, not known thought. 
not, not thought, not thought known, known. Yeah. Pardon, not thought known. Um, tell us what happened after that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it turned me into a writer. Ultimately, I really do. The, For sure, the, the unthought known. Um, so what happened after that was that it took thirty six hours, um, and you know, there's no, there are no. For anyone who wants to read the book, there are no spoilers. The book is so not about what happens. No. You know? No. I have people who know me intimately and have known the story beat by beat who, when they read the book, say, I was up till two o'clock in the morning. I couldn't go to sleep till I knew everything was okay. Could <laughs> not stop reading this thing. I, people have been telling me that. It's the most wonderful compliment, it especially is. in our world today. I, I, I'm studying it so much because the, the way that you led us through everything backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards past to future to present it was so so deft thank you because it was the only it, it, the story had to be told in all those layers because yes. it's such a layered story yes but so what happened was yeah. you know that like a rocket ship was that from the moment that i realized that my father hadn't been my biological father it took 36 hours until i was looking at a youtube video of the man who was my biological father. Wow. 36 hours. And I mean, I understood very quickly that, um, that I had been donor conceived, that there had to have been sperm that had been mixed with my dad's or just used outright. Um, my mother had used the word Institute and she had said Philadelphia. So that took about a nanosecond on Google of course, to find the defunct Institute on the campus of Penn. Right. And then my husband and I were actually flying across the country. We had a trip planned and we were on planes and in airports and I was walking through the world feeling very much like, who's my father? You know, where do I come from? It was a, a profound rootlessness. I was dizzy. I was really, I mean, I now recognize those symptoms as being traumatized yep. and, and you know, shock, yep. but I really felt like I was sort of disintegrating. Um, but we were on a plane um, and we had a conversation in which we were trying to think, well, who, who, what would the profile of a sperm donor have been in the early 1960s on the campus of Penn? And we both had the thought, probably a medical student and probably a Penn. And I don't know how we, we didn't, we weren't educated in that world right. or anything like that, but we both had the thought. And then there was the first cousin on my page. And so my husband, who has great journalistic chops, um, started kind of just digging in, looking for, I mean, there was a name associated with the cousin's page. So looking into that name, not coming up with anything. And one of the most indelible memories that I have ever had or will ever have in my life is of waking up in San Francisco mm. the morning after we got there. And even like my eyes were closed and I could hear my husband typing on the other side of the room and I could smell the Starbucks coffee. He'd been up for hours. And the first words he said to me is he said, it isn't the, the, the name associated with it were both names that sounded like they could be first names. And, and, but they were in order, so we assumed it was first name, last name. And, and he said, it's not, it's last name, first name. And it like unlocked the, uh, or it was the beginning of unlocking the identity of the first cousin. And we got a friend on the phone with us who knows a lot about navigating yeah. um, all of the online genetic, you know, sites and, it was like, bam, bam, bam. There was the name of the person. Turns out that it was the wife of the first cousin. Looked her up on Facebook. There she was. She had a husband on her Facebook page who had the same initials. So, bam, that's clearly my biological first cousin. And all I could think when I was looking at him with this kind of, even within all the shock, yeah. this kind of piercing clarity, yes. was if you're my first cousin, then an uncle of yours is my biological father. And we just looked up a couple of, like, his name and, I don't know, his wife's name, something like that in Google. And his mother had passed away a couple of years earlier, and there was an obit. And in the obituary notice, there were, were the names of all the people who had survived, uh, the family that had survived his mother. And among them were two brothers of the mother. Right. And one of them was a doctor. And bam, look up the name of the doctor, and... He um, was a 78-year-old retired physician living in Portland, Oregon, and he had gone to the University of Pennsylvania mm. exactly in the years when I was conceived. Mm. And, and I looked just like him. I mean, and then because he's, he's retired, but he, he lectures on medical ethics, which is just one of those details that you can't make up in this situation. I mean. Um, 
And, you know, there he was on YouTube giving a lecture, which is something that I do often. Right. He was standing behind a lectern, something I do often. I was thinking, you know, if he had been a fireman or something, it would have been something <laughs> I don't do often. But it was something I do. And he was giving a talk <laughs> in a you know academic setting, something I do. And then he was running a Q&A and calling people in the back row. And the two things that I noticed, I didn't notice right away that I looked just like him because it's hard to see yourself in yes. a 78-year-old man when you're a 52-year-old woman or yes. however old I was. Um, what I noticed was the, the way that he was moving his hands. It's the way I move my hands. Oh, gosh. And I recognized it. I recognized the gestures that he was making. And, and then when he started doing a, the Q&A, my husband said to me, my God, he even runs a Q&A like you. There was just this quality to his personhood yeah. that was familiar. Yeah. And I realized that I had never felt it before. Oh. Because, you you know, I didn't know I had never felt it before. I wasn't walking around thinking, wow, I've never felt this particular feeling. But I had never felt that. I was very, very close with my dad. Adored my dad. Still adore my dad. I have a soul connection to my dad. Yeah. But I did not have that familiar connection with him. I get that. Everyone was calling your dad your adoptive dad, let's say, or I, how did we talk about him? I can't use I'm that not adoptive term. You know, dad. it's sort of like that. Those that would be an appropriate term. Social dad is another term, no. um, but I just—he's just, he's just my dad. dad. He's my dad, and I actually have found myself um, shying away from a lot of the terminology yeah. around this stuff. I mean, yeah. in the donor-conceived world. My biological father would be my bio dad. No, I mean, it no, sounds no. like like he should have a cape or something, no, you know, no, like no. and a big symbol on his. You, you can't know, say that. I I don't, and I actually call him by his name, or I call him my biological father, which is a lot of syllables, but that is the truth. I don't call him my sperm donor. I don't call him bio dad. There's another term in that world. People are discovering, um, you know, they discover that they're donor conceived, and then they discover like scores of half siblings, and. Those half siblings in the terminology of the of this world are called diblings. Oh dear. Donor siblings. Oh dear. And I just recoil against that because it's an attempt to put cute language yeah. on something profound. No. And as someone who's like I truck in language, tr language is what I do. Yeah. And I just it's too profound, too huge, too human, too potentially beautiful or pa or potentially painful or whatever the story is gonna be for each individual person to make it all like a cute, name. a cute, a cute name. One of the most profound uh, moments in inheritance, just to sort of wrap this up was when you found your half sister, I guess his daughter on Twitter. She found me first. Right. And the moment it was so eloquently described the moment that you clicked follow back you called it a modern smoke signal to let her know that you were here it made me cry so long for so mm. many minutes i cried and cried and cried and i was just like jesus i'm crying about a twitter follow right now <laughs> i but, wonder if that's a first <laughs> but it's like the most i really felt it and ever since then i've looked at I don't know why, but I've looked at social media and following and unfollowing and following back as this, you know, it's a smoke signal. It's the way that we reach each other. It's the way that we let each other know that we're paying attention. It's so beautiful. It's true. It's just so beautiful. So you ended up getting in contact with your biological father. You ended up finding him after some resistance on his part and his second wife's part. First wife. First wife. He's only had one wife. He's been married for 50, 50 oh, plus okay. years. Okay, yeah. got it. A little bit of resistance there, but I think ultimately he came around to the fact that here you are, a stunning mind and a, a full heart, let's say, for lack of anything better. And he finally got interested in knowing you. He did. I, You know, I think... One of the things I've been thinking a lot about about my, my story and this journey and this discovery is that it's one in which ultimately everyone has tried to do the right thing. Mm. Everyone's tried to do the kind thing, the thoughtful thing, mm. um, all, all the way through. I mean, even the fact that he responded at all 
in the very beginning to my email entreaty saying, you know, and my email, which was very careful and very respectful and really letting him know that I wasn't asking him for anything. I was just in a state of shock and trying to understand what had happened. Yes. Um, but he, I mean, I hear stories now from time to time that are so painful, you know, yeah. where somebody just gets ghosted or um, gets yeah. two words back, not interested, all sorts of really painful stories. And so I'm aware that that kindness, you know, I, I thought a lot about what, you know, what do we owe each other in this new world, you know, where, where there are no more secrets, where people who made choices to do things in anonymity and were promised anonymity are no longer anonymous, where children who grew up being a secret are discovering what that secret is and want to know the truth of their identity. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I really think that it all has to be rewritten and we're rewriting it right now. I mean, just for ourselves, it just, mm -hmm. there's no playbook for it. So it's just this brand new territory. So, you know, are we family? Is it, you know, are, I mean, we sign our letters to each other, love, um, but we're not having Thanksgiving together. You know, my family are the people that I grew up, my dad who raised me is who formed, you know, my psyche and so much of who I am. But there also is undeniably this biological piece that's very, very real and that I'm incredibly lucky is, you know, that he is as wonderful as he is. Yeah. It's such a beautiful, heartwarming story by the end. Inheritance. How has the book tour been? Really intense. Yeah. Um, I've never published a book in nine books prior to this one that sort of published right into just a whirlwind yeah. of interest and... Um, feeling and in my events have been I mean the book's doing really well and it hit the New York Times bestseller list and, oh congrats congratulations and, wow. st and stayed on for four weeks wow yeah which is astounding it's not astounding you know what we are in such a time where anyone would be so happy to just look at someone else's story for five minutes and get lost well that's the thing it was like basically all political books and me yeah. <laughs> right yeah no that's true yeah um but m even more than that, the the crowds, are, you know, just mm -hmm. all around the country. I've done 29 events as of today, wow. all over the country in 20 different cities. And what I'm experiencing um, is people's vulnerability and people's courage. And many people are showing up because they're readers of mine, but many people are showing up too because they are keepers of secrets who are suddenly realizing that they need to share the truth with their children, or they are adoptive mothers who've just found their birth children who are in their 50s and 60s and older, and donor-conceived people who've just discovered the truth of their identity and who are searching just, and people discovering different kinds. They're discovering half-siblings they didn't know they had. Their father is discovering children that they never knew they had. Mm. Um, this combination of DNA testing and the internet is doing something so powerful that, you know, and is so resonant in our culture. I mean, if you think about the Me Too movement yeah. and the way that one woman spoke her truth and then another one did and then another one did and then, like, bam, you have a movement and you have real shifts in society and culture uh, and humanity. Mm -hmm. And this feels like another one yeah. because there can't be those kinds of... We're at, at the end of secrecy of this kind. And that's a good thing. I think it is a good thing. I think ultimately all of the work that's being done in the sort of wellness healing space towards valuing vulnerability and uh, heightening awareness of people who are willing to be more honest than they've ever been and transparency of all kinds I think is now much more valuable than it ever was. It's nice to see the as you said, movement, but also it's almost like a revolution, sort of like a, a, a resistance against all of the hiding and the lying and the what's happening in the political arena. No, it, it's true. It's, it's so powerful. And, you know, when you said vulnerability, I mean, for years people have been saying to me, 
you know, you must feel so vulnerable or you must, you know, feel vulnerable because you have exposed yourself in your work. And I, I don't, I never have, I don't now. I wondered if I would with this book because it's pretty new, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's ex- an experience that I couldn't even speak about two and a half years ago. And now I've published a book into the world about it, mm. but it feels like strength to me. Yeah. It feels like an incredible empowerment in the best possible way. It feels like liberation yeah. because, you know, any time um, I'm up there speaking without filters about my experience in the deepest possible way and having crafted it into a story. I mean, you know, people will often use the phrase with writers who have written personally, thank you for sharing your story. And I always feel mm-hmm. like, I didn't share my story. I, I really spent two and a half years alone in a room crafting it. Yeah. But when I get up and speak about it, I am sharing. And that is just the most fantastic feeling to do that and have it land. And what it does is it gives other, other people permission to do just that. Yeah. So my book, my book tour is like this kind of thrilling gathering yes. you know, everywhere I go. And the people who are coming are then kind of seeing each other. So that's really exciting. Electrified. So beautiful. Um, I usually ask every guest three questions. They're pretty nice. You can answer in any way that you wish, and you can pass on any of them. Anything uh, in your life that needs healing right now? You know, I still have not been able to um, fully get back to my yoga practice Mm. because even though the one place that I do is Yoga Glow with you, yes, um, I even put a flat screen TV up on the wall in my meditation room. No, only for that purpose. No way. Only for Yoga Glow. Do you cover it with a with a sheet when you're not using it? No, it just sits there. You know, there's other black and white. There are black and white photographs in the room, and so it sort of just blends in like there's. It doesn't bother me. I wondered if it would. But um, I think it's because the body that has practiced yoga since 1990 was a body that I was kind of like fundamentally not like mistaken about in some way or not supportive of. Yeah, like I didn't understand it. And it was true for the first year or so with my meditation practice that I also couldn't meditate. And that came back completely. But the, except for the last few weeks, but the, uh, but yoga, it's almost felt like, I mean, it, it's been such a huge part of my life for so long. Mm. Yeah, so that would be my answer. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. That's a good answer. We can fix that. Um, I have to go on retreat with you or something. That is never a bad idea. Mm, yeah. Never. Italy, end of August. Ooh. Yes. Ooh. Most beautiful place. Hmm. It's perfect. Just okay. outside of Milan, Malpensa. Hmm. What's your favorite view funny that you should say Italy. So my favorite view, um, my husband and my f- writer friend, Hannah Tinti and I started a writer's conference. It'll be 13 years ago now in Positano. Of course. And it's at this hotel, magnificent hotel called the Sierra News. The writer's conference is called Sirenland. And every year, um, we return and we have the same suite with the same balcony every year. My son was six when we started going, you know, wow. it, it's, it's been, a huge part of our family's life. And the view is um, in part of the um, the sea, but there's also these small islands in the distance that are called the Lagali Islands. There's all sorts of stories about them. Diaghilev lived there, a lot of dancers. Um, Nureyev lived there. Now just a man lives there. You know, a man, it sounds very mysterious. But there are these very beautifully shaped islands that almost look like a body that's like floating in the sea mm. and opening those curtains every morning to that view it's just always heartlifting and it's always the weather is always different and the sky is always different and it's always in every single iteration magnificent dude that's a good answer i get all kinds of answers what does third question what does prayer mean to you i have two responses one is um something that Sylvia Borstein said to me a long time ago that was a game changer for me, which was um, she was teaching uh, metta 
meditation and I was new to metta and I wasn't yet friends with Sylvia. She's now one of my dearest friends, but I just encountered her and I realized I'd found my teacher. And I raised my hand during a Q&A session at Kripalu. I'm not a hand raiser, I never raised my hand. My hand just went up in the air and she called on me. And I stumbled out some, stuttered out something about having been raised with a lot of re religion and I didn't know, you know, these phrases, you know, may I be safe, may I be happy, may I be strong, may I live with ease. You know, is, I, I got all caught up with, who am I asking that to? And if I'm asking that to somebody, is that, is, is, is that, does that mean I'm asking God? And does that mean it's a prayer? And, but, but wait, I'm not sure I believe it. No, my, my mind got all knotted up and all that. And Sylvia just kind of tilted her head to the side. And she said, I don't know that you have to think of it metaphysically, really. It's really an expression of a wish. And that was it. It unlocked for me the, you know, the, and whenever I lead metta as a teacher myself, I actually use the language, these blessings, these wishes, because for the people there who can't get a hold of blessing, wish will do just fine. And really, what is prayer but, but a wish in some way? Yeah. Doesn't require the presence of an other granting. It's just... It's an acknowledgement of a wish. And, you know, in, in devotion, I, I, I wrote quite a bit about Thomas Merton, mm -hmm. and I love reading Merton, but... Merton really has a, you know, he has a kind of an ongoing dialogue with God. And it was the first time that I understood that being a spiritual person did not necessarily mean, well, it didn't mean believing without doubt, you know, without wrestling. And so the whole idea that it's okay to wrestle, that it's okay to doubt, and that that's actually part of what it is um, to be connected um, was a really powerful one to me. That and that and the feeling that, uh, or the sense that it's not like all or nothing. It's not one way or the highway. It's not us and them. It's so, it's so not that. So not that. Do you have any favorite passages and in inheritance that you fancy reading? I can certainly, I'd love to. Yeah, I love hearing you read. And also, I just wanted to acknowledge that your dad, you know, your lifetime dad, everybody thought of him as a hero, which I think is important just to point out. Yeah, and I, I came to think of him as a hero yeah. myself That's over the sweet. course. I mean, I think, he, I think he did something that wasn't easy for him in order to be able to allow me to exist. And talk about the unthought known you can be sure that he was hosting the unthought known regarding you and just looking at you. Oh, I think he actually veered closer to knowing. Right. And, you know, couldn't have loved me more, mm. but, I think, but I think he knew mm. that I wasn't his biological daughter. Mm. Yeah. So I'm going to read a little bit from a, um, a favorite scene uh, with my aunt. My, oh, yes. My, I wept through that, too. This is my Aunt Shirley who is now 95, at the time she was 93. And I had flown to Chicago to tell her, mostly because I wondered whether she might have known something and I was so intent, um, urgently intent on unraveling whatever I could. And when I did tell her, she hadn't had any idea. But she spent the rest of the afternoon trying very hard to make me feel better. Hmm. Um, and she's just about the most poetic person I know. So this is after she understands all this. You're not an accident of history, Danny, Shirley said. Her eyes were brimming. Not as far as I'm concerned and not as far as the world is concerned. This isn't about the cold scientific facts. I have to tell you, in every way, and I'm not saying it to make you feel good, and I'm taking a chance saying it because you'll think I'm making it up, but between you and Paul, there was paternity, ownership, mm. kinship. She trained her whole 93-year-old self, every cell in her being, in the direction of consoling me. Every bit of energy, it was the purest manifestation of love I had ever experienced. Knowing what you know, you're more of a daughter to Paul than you can possibly imagine. You take something that isn't your own and you breathe life into it. You create it, 
and it becomes your creation. You are an agent to help my brother express the finest kind of love. Yeah. She knew. She drilled right down into my biggest fear, and I... It was so extraordinarily perceptive of her. She understood that at that time I felt like an accident of history. Making a discovery like that about yourself, having had a very different narrative in place, mm. causes a feeling of like alienation or you know just profound disconnect. And she went straight to that. And those words rang in my ears for years afterwards. You're not an accident of history. And Later, as I was writing the book, I had the thought, I had a couple of really, really crystal clear thoughts while I was writing the book. And one of them was, either we're all accidents of history, or none of us are accidents of history. But it's not like, because I was conceived in this wackadoodle way, <laughs> <laughs> um, that doesn't make me more of an accident of history than someone born to two parents who have been together and are having a romantic rendezvous in Paris on their honeymoon or right, whatever. Right. Um, because every single time a human being is created, it is this brand new, completely miraculous, totally accidental thing. I mean, what the, what did the, the, the Buddhists say about, you know, to be born into a human body, you know, is like the rarest of rarest, you know, rarest things. And, and so that helped me a lot. It was one of those sort of irrefutable thoughts that I had where I thought, okay, I can really, I can really get behind this and feel it. Um, but she was the one who, who put it in my mind and in my heart. I wonder too, considering the fact that she had just learned of this, if she herself in some way felt like an accident of history, because there were the words right in front of her, they came out of her mouth so quickly, it wasn't like she had time to digest and assimilate the information. No, I think it was this profound act of generosity. I think she put whatever she was oh. feeling, probably a certain amount of heartbrokenness for her for her brother. Got it. Um, and I think she is so extraordinary. Got um, it. And so able to. I I just I don't think she was thinking for a single solitary second about herself. Got it. So it was her bridging a world to her brother. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what it was. She's told me many times that when he was dying. He had, you know, he had been in a car accident, and when he was dying, she said to him, I will always watch out for Danny. Wow. And she was watching out for Danny. Yep. She's still alive. She is. Surely. Yeah. In freezing cold Chicago, why don't we bring her here? I know. <laughs> Let's get her over here. We could go visit her every day. They just, they just added Chicago, I think, to my, to my book tour, and I was like, yes. Perfect. Yeah. I can't, uh, I can't thank you enough. I have loved it. I mean, I always love talking to you. I love this conversation. Yeah. I'm really grateful to have you in my life and as a friend and also as <laughs> this source oh, for my writing. Thank you. <laughs>